Hi everyone, this is Dr. Anna and uh, tonight's topic, today's topic is the late Paleozoic. This is the first segment of this chapter. In this chapter, we got to talk about the formation of the supercontinent Pangaea. Um, the first thing was that uh, the Tarconia orogeny, of course. Remember when uh, the island art collided into North America and the eastern shore become like the Colorado today? And, and in front of it had the Fornan Basin where the Paleozoic coal cycles formed. So the second step is when Laurentia and Baltica collide and it formed La Regia, that's now the new name of North America. This is what we call the Caledonian orogeny, and it happened during the Silurian. The next one is when La Regia and Gondwana collides. This is what we call the Acadian orogeny in the Devonian, right here. And then there is the Antler orogeny, which is in the Cordilleran. And then La Regia and Siberia collides. And this is the Elasmore orogeny. And Baltica and Siberia collides to form the Ural Mountains in Russia, actually, today. Um, now, what do I want you to know? The Tokoni. I just want you to know the, the Appalachian formation. So, starting with the Tokoni orogeny, after that, the Caledonian, and then the Arcadian. And then there is one more which is coming up later, the Alleghenian. Um, so now let's go through the late Paleozoic uh, Paleogeography. This is how everything was in the Devonian. As you can see, the Devonian, uh, North America still on the equator, so everything is exactly still the same as it was in the early Paleozoic. This here is the early Carboniferous, you can see that um, the continents are getting really close to each other. I bet this ocean is kind of cold, closed. And this here is the big new ocean with Tethys. And this here is when Gondwana actually and La Regio have collided to form all these mountains right here, which is basically the Appalachian if you think about it. And that's the Tethys again. And this here is the late Permian. Basically, Pac-Man is all together. Um, this is the big ocean with Tethys. That's the Pentelus. So that's the Pac-Man. I told you that I kind of wanted you to be able to draw it. It's It can be very simple. Like, this is Pangaea. And that's Pentelus of the ocean. It says it, it says it right here, and this here is the Tethys, and that's Pangaea, so you could draw that. Basically, this is the same thing. Here is Pac-Man, the Pantalassa Ocean, and the Tethys Ocean. So, what was the Palo climate like? During the Devon Devonian, we know that there is a uniform warm climate. During the Carboniferous, on the other hand, Gondwana moved over to the South Pole, setting up everything into a glaciation time. We have a whole lot of tillite during this time, so there is a bunch of proofs of uh, Ice Age. Uh, and then, uh, this is the time when we have the very, very widespread coal deposition. We're going to talk about that a whole lot. And then during the Permian, the supercontinent Pangaea is together and that is going to bring extreme climate conditions. Nobody really knows about them that much. So this slide actually shows you what we know. We do know that in the early Carboniferous, the global temperature was about 22 degrees Celsius, which is equal with about 72 Fahrenheit. Uh, however, uh, after cooling during the middle of Carboniferous, the average temperature become about 12, so it really dropped 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, the CO2 during the early Carboniferous period was very, very high, like 1,500%. And then in the co-forming time, you know, the, the black 
line is the atmospheric CO2 and this shows you it in ppm so that's parts per million and the blue is the average global temperature so you can see that actually the uh, the CO2 has always been higher except during the Pennsylvania and today these are the two lowermost CO2 during the earth history uh, the atmosphere today contains about 370 ppm which is 0.037 percent and it was about the same during the Carboniferous uh, so that's what the last sentence says that actually during the whole Phenerozoic time only during the Carboniferous and today is when it's less than 400 ppm so if you put it in perspective it's not such a high CO2 because of the uh, you know when you have a lot of coal deposits like we have in the Pennsylvania um, what is what the coal does to make food you're right the, the trees are photosynthesizing photosynthesis is really basically the CO2 from the atmosphere and I have said it so many times CO2 plus the water which is the H2O with the UV radiation no the sun energy the sun's energy and it makes sugar plus oxygen a lot of it I think every single uh, photosynthesis is about producing six uh, diatomic molecules of oxygen so it's pretty important now because we had so much plant cover and they all photosynthesized actually there was an oxygen peak around 31 35 percent during the the carboniferous which caused that uh, that we had like extreme big uh, arthropods and other really extremely big big um, one-celled organisms the fusulin this is a, a this is what we call the gigantism and this here is a horsefly which shows uh, these characters and that's a millipad basically which shows gigantism like look it's almost as big as a human and today it's like this big or less and these are the fusilinates uh, which which also were relatively big they were this big and they were one had organisms and this takes us to the ice age like we have had a couple of ice age uh, during the earth history uh, basically these are the Precambrian ones the really big ones the blue is the ice house time and the green is the greenhouse time so then we had a very short one in the Ordovician right here and then we have this one during the Carboniferous and we are in one today <coughs> sorry and now we are at the the slow Paleozoic sequences we have talked about during the first uh, Paleozoic chapter and now we are at the Ordovician Silurian so we are right there uh, and we have two late Paleozoic sequence we have to talk about one is the Kaskaskia and the other one is the Absaroka So here we are with the late Paleozoic Cratonic sequences, Cratonic, Cratonic sequences. I don't know how to say that word, so you can help me out with. Uh, the first one we have to talk about is the Cascaskia, which is going from Devonian to Pennsylvanian. And the Cascaskia starts just like all the others with major unconformity. On top of the unconformity, it's going to be extremely pure quartz sandstone in this case we call it oriscony and the source area is like you know the Avalon the island are collided with the continent so it made the mountains that's the Taconia Highland and that is the source area for the oriscony sandstone um, 
after the the fourth sentence says the transgression went on and the whole continent got um, covered with the apiric sea or, or in, um, apiric sea, you know, the water which covers the continent and um, since North America is still in the equator area, so therefore it's all limestone, we have very important reef and evaporate uh, facies, especially in Canada, the Williston Basin, where this reef facies is a very important oil reservoir. Uh, the peak transgression will show back black shale at this time, and then as the regression comes back, uh, carbonates are going to form again, and the whole thing finishes with unconformity. So this is every single sequence, unconformity, quartz and stone, carbonate, shell, carbonate, unconformity. So in more detail, the boundary between Tipacanu and Kaskesco is marked by a major unconformity. And then the, the transgression of the Kaskeskia in the early Devonian produced a clean quartz sandstone, the Oriskany sandstone. Uh, and I told you already that the source area was the Taconi Highland or the Appalachian Mobile Land. Um, and this map shows you the uh, distribution of the uh, sandstone. Right here, it's interesting because it's widespread, it. and not only that, it's very clean quartz sandstone, which is good for the white uh, glass, it also contains some gas, natural gas. So, in that way, that's very, very important. Um, at Berkeley Springs and Hancock, um, this sandstone has been quarried for glass sand. Uh, the Oriskany is a remarkably clean quartz sandstone and it crumbles easily because it has calcite cement and so therefore it, it's pretty soft. After the sandstone, the carbonates are coming back as the transgression continues and um, some of these carbonates are uh, reefs and there is a lot of evaporate deposits also. In many other areas of the world we have the same kind of sediments from this time such as in Belgium, Central Europe, Australia and so on. And the next slide shows you the reef in Western Canada. Because of the, uh, the reef, the basin behind the reef becomes restricted and that's going to be source rock for oil and then the oil gets squeezed out as it becomes liquid and will be stored in the reef facies. That's very characteristic. This here is just a picture of this, uh, this reef right there in Williston Basin and this this uh, slide the next one shows you the reef builders like um, tabulate corals usually uh, made these reefs. Now there is a very important uh, area we just go oh, sorry before we uh, I forgot this one there is an interesting uh, place in Western Australia uh, where this Devonian limestone is sticking out of the ground and interestingly they call it the Great Barrier Reef of, the, of Western Australia. This is how the rocks look like, it's very coarse. These are the, the reef builders and that's how uh, some of these reefs look like close up. And now we are at the black shell. So the, the time period which represents the peak transgression is represented by black shale. Whenever you have black shale, what that means is uh, that the ocean is really stratified 
uh, when there is no temperature difference between the pole and the equator, you have no currents, oceanic currents, so therefore the ocean will be stratified, we call it. That just means that you have an oxygen, oxygen rich top part, so this is a lot of oxygen and nutrients. And uh, in the lower part, there is no oxygen, no oxygen. So when things die, they cannot decay, but they will stay undecayed in the no oxygen zone. Just like this, this figure shows it. Um, in the eastern United States, this black shell is called Chattanooga shell. Um, it is very, very well developed along the Appalachian mobile belt all the way to the Mississippi Valley. But of course, they can be found elsewhere too. This is usually very thin layered, about 10 meter, like 30 feet thick, and rich in, in, in plants and, and brachiopods and all those kind of animals. They sometimes have bituminous in it, bituminous, and that just means that they mostly have degraded algae. Uh, and that is the source material for the oil. Uh, if you have black shell present, that means that it, there is no oxygen in the, in the bo bottom of the ocean. This is just a map of the black shell, the distribution of the black shell area. And this one is just shows how does it look. Because it's black shell, there is no oxygen. So if you have any iron, it's going to be pyrite, the FES2, remember? And when the pyrite actually reacts with the oxygen up on the surface and water, it will become reddish brownish because it goes into iron oxide and sulfuric acid. So this layer right here is full of pyrite. And then when it... Um, chemically weathered away, it made all this iron staining. That's just another picture of this shell. A similar situation, situation happening today in just one place in the world so we can actually learn about the stratified ocean and that is the Black Sea. Right here, this is the Black Sea. So the Black Sea has layered uh, structure, as we call it, stratified ocean with a very, very oxygen-rich top layer and no oxygen in the bottom. This is just showing you the oceanic currents as we know them today. And I'm going to finish. This was the first segment of the late Paleozoic. And I will see you in the second segment. Bye for now. I think I'm going to go sleep and I'll continue tomorrow. Bye.